So what kind of swords did generals carry in medieval China? Well, let's have a look. Hi folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatorius. So what we've got here is the LK Chen Grand Marshal Jian uh, from the Ming Dynasty. So it's modelled one-to-one -one on a surviving original Ming Dynasty um, sword of a type carried by generals and marshals, high-ranking officers essentially in the Chinese military between the mid 14th century and all the way through to about the 17th century actually. But this is fundamentally, by European standards anyway, a medieval sword. So often on this channel we're looking at things like long swords and arming swords and lang messer and falchions. This is the type of sword carried by, should we call them high status individuals, at the time of those swords in medieval Europe. Now, one of the first things you'll notice is the very distinctive style of hilt, which you may in fact uh, recognize from more recent designs of a GN, which have a guard somewhat like that and a pommel somewhat like that. The grip lengths um, vary and the details of the decoration may vary, but fundamentally, this style of guard and this style of pommel are modeled after a certain type of mushroom and a certain type of gourd. Um, and now the mushroom, please forgive give my uh, Chinese pronunciation, but I think it's Ling Chi, something like that, and the, the gourd we refer to. Now, um, indeed, sometimes, uh, that's, first of all, the, the mushroom, uh, fungi, fungi, uh, was um, believed to give certain uh, kind of um, health benefits, and still is, in fact, in Chinese medicine, and the gourd was sometimes used to contain um, artifacts and things of in Taoist religion that were supposed to bring good luck, essentially. Um, and we still see, see this uh, to some degree in the modern world as well, uh, and some, you know, belief systems still use amulets and stuff like that. So it's very much part of that kind of uh, context. So to Western eyes, often the shape of these pommels and guards look a little bit odd, uh, but actually they became extremely, I won't say universal, but very, very common um, and carried on for centuries. Now this type of sword is different from the type of um, Dao that was carried by a lot of troops at the time. Now this is in fact a later, um, this is a 19th century style of Dao, but it will give you the general idea. So there were various types of single-edged, sometimes curved, sometimes straight, quite falchion-like or messer-like swords that were carried by lots of soldiers, uh, including officers, in this period, in the Ming Dynasty. So uh, by Western standards, as I say, what would be the medieval period, so the 14th, 15th centuries into the 16th century. And um, however, it does appear that the Jian was carried by um, high-ranking civilians, nobles, but additionally it was carried by those same people when they were operating in a military capacity. So if they were a general, field marshal equivalent, whatever, as is shown in lots of art of the period, uh, both paintings and statues and things like this, they often wore these types of straight double-edged jian. Now you can see that the LK Chen version of the sword here, which as I've mentioned is a one-to-one -one, um, replica of an original surviving example, um, has a wooden grip and scabbard, very very nice uh, wood. You can find all of the details incidentally linked below uh, to their website where you can find there's uh, different uh, steel options for the blades. We'll talk about the blade in a second. Um, but it, it describes um, some degree of the manufacturer and the materials that are, have gone into this. Um, but it's very closely based on the original. So you'll notice that there are several um, brass or copper alloy fittings along the scabbard. The wooden scabbard is a, a self-sustaining object in its own right, but the metal fittings both add to the wearing of the sword. So it would attach to slings down here like that and held at that kind of angle usually, slightly above uh, horizontal. But additionally, they also strengthen the scabbard. So obviously the shape at the end um, stops it um, getting damaged uh, from being bashed against things or split or anything like that. Equally, if you're standing on the ground, it prevents damp from penetrating the end of the scabbard. And then these fittings along here, which are not dissimilar, it has to be said, to the Japanese um, tachi uh, mountings, uh, assist in holding the two halves of the wooden scabbard together and if it does split or whatever it, it keeps it together and keeps it as a functional scabbard. Now let's dispense with the scabbard. Um, just before I do I just want to mention that the scabbard does fit into the guard. So you'll notice that um, when that guard seats around the top of the scabbard it is 
watertight, uh, at least from rain. Um, maybe not if you actually submerge it, uh, but uh, from a, an upwards angle, there is no real practical way that rain and moisture can enter into that scabbard because the top of the guard actually seats like a cup fully around the scabbard and the scabbard goes in there. So you kind of got a guard and a rain guard all built into one, which is quite a nice unit. Now, let's have a little look at the blade. And here we go. So it's a rather attractive blade, straight, double-edged, and you'll notice that it doesn't have an awful lot of taper to it. Um, the edges are almost parallel. In fact, it has a very slight amount of taper. Uh, let's just put the scabbard down here for a second. And it has some degree of distal taper, in fact, quite notable distal taper. It's really quite a thick blade, very, very thick up here. It might look like it's gonna be a particularly light sword but it's not especially light and um, we'll talk about the stats in a second it's very very thick to about there and then it um, slims down here and doesn't ever get really super thin towards the point so it is a relatively um, again I'm being careful with this because it is sharp um, it is a relatively thick and rigid blade strong blade and you'll notice that when I flex it due to the distal taper it stays pretty much totally straight to about there. It starts to flex here, and then most of the flex is in the last third of the blade. There we go. But I can tell you, if we smack the pommel there, you can see it does have some degree of vibration. It's got a vibrational node around there near to the center of percussion. And um, it's, uh, it is nevertheless a rigid blade. It's not hugely wide, but it is quite thick. And you can just feel the way it tracks in the air. It has authority to it. It, it moves very nicely and it's nimble but equally you can tell that when, once it's moving it's got a good amount of inertia in it and bear in mind this is a type of sword that was used uh, on the battlefield uh, as a battlefield sword some people see the Jian as a civilian sword in this era but actually it was carried by high-ranking uh, generals now were they expected to fight? Well, probably often not, but nevertheless, I have no doubt that this could function on the battlefield as a fully, um, you know, as a fully robust and uh, respectable weapon on the battlefield. Yes, you can use it against halberds and spears that were used at the time. Yes, you can use it against a, a dao, for example. And uh, this blade is thicker than most dao are and weighs about the same. So it has a different format. It might not cut as well as a dao, um, but it has some other advantages. Now, one of the things you'll be wondering, I'm almost certain most of you who watch this channel at this point, will be like, Matt, what happened to the point? Um, now, this is one of the interesting things. If we look at Ming Dynasty, um, so by medieval, uh, by European standards, kind of medieval era, um, Jian, some of them don't have points. <laughs> Some of them are rounded like this. Now, I won't say it's blunt, uh, it's rounded. Now, we do find parallels to this, actually, if we go back into uh, certain Iron Age swords, and in fact, if we look at the Viking era, I won't say that Viking era swords are fully rounded quite like this, but some of them are, are, are almost blunt on, or blunt from that point of view. But I should point out that this edge essentially can continue around the tip. So I wouldn't really want to be stabbed by that per se, certainly not out of um, armor or out of protective clothing. Um, so whilst that is, from your point of view, a rounded tip, it's still quite a thin edged object. Now. The question is, ah, and I should also mention, many of these are pointed and do have points in the end. Now, I can't unfortunately give you the answer of why were some rounded and why were some pointed. We just don't know, and I have spoken to the people at um, LK Chen about this, and they have sent me lots of pictorial examples of originals where some are rounded and some are pointed, and um, we just don't know why. Now, I do find it interesting. I mean, it's very interesting why were they rounded instead of pointed, but then you've also got to ask, well, if there was some reason to have them rounded, why were some of them pointed? Now, this is a point at which you can uh, throw in your, <laughs> your hats into the ring. What, what do you think? Do you have any theories about this? As far as I'm aware, there is no written source material from Chinese history explaining why that might be the case. Um, equally, there's nothing from Chinese martial arts. I don't believe that explain, I mean, there might be some theories, but I don't know that there's anything that really fixed explains why that might be the case. 
From a purely mechanical point of view, um, I could think that perhaps if you're cutting at the, with the real tip uh, and you're really focusing on using this as a cutting weapon rather than a thrusting weapon, then a rounded tip, as we've seen with things like falchions and indeed Viking era swords, a rounder, fatter tip means you can cut with the very tip of the weapon, which means that you can hit from further away. That being said, it comes at quite a great cost, of course, because when you come to thrust, uh, there, there is a, as you can see, I can push that into my hand and it does start to hurt a bit. But the simple fact is that if, if anyone's wearing anything like lamellar, padded armor, silk even, uh, aside from things like a mail or anything like that, but if they're wearing even any degree of layers, there's a good chance that that point won't penetrate through there. Um, so why? Why would you rob yourself of the point? I don't know the answer to that. But some of these were pointed, and indeed, if you liked this sword and you wanted it to be pointed, you could quite easily, in, I would imagine, an hour or two with um, a file, turn that into a pointed blade. Um, now, the blade itself is very nicely edged. It has a single bevel, um, no secondary bevel, and that, of course, is correct for a lot of historical swords from around the world. So there is no, there's not even a micro bevel as far as I can see. It is absolutely just a single bevel to the edge. In terms of the um, hilt, I find these quite interesting. Now, from again, from a Western point of view, you might look at a long hilt and think, well, was this occasionally used two-handed? Now, I have to be honest and say, I don't know. Um, I think it's entirely possible that occasionally these were used two-handed. However, predominantly, as far as all the art is concerned and the martial arts, the uh, treatises that survive and so on and so forth, and the systems that survive, um, these do se seem to have been predominantly one-handed swords. Now, they are not completely unique in having a longer grip than you need on a one-handed sword because we can find comparisons with the Langmesser, you can find comparison with the Burmese Da, um, the, uh, the katana when it's used one-handed, and indeed the uh, wakasashi sometimes, although wakasashi grips uh, vary in length. Um, so there are plenty of other, you know, the, uh, the krabi, for example, from Thailand, there are other comparisons for swords that have a longer grip than you need for a one-handed sword. Why might that be? Well, balance um, is one obvious main reason. Um, so, by having that extension at the back end here, and bear in mind this pommel is not solid, this is hollow. So we've got a hollow pommel and you've got a hollow guard. That's not an especially heavy pommel, and so having this extension at the back means that you have a really nice sort of balance and heft to the, to the weapon, and you can move it very nimbly around. Additionally, and this is, I think, a less important part, but if we look at, for example, European, um, or German specifically, Langmesser sources, when you have an extension of grip out the back, if you're coming in close, you can indeed use this for hooking actions. So if you've, um, if you've grabbed someone's wrist, for example, you can hook the blade out of the person's hand, or you can hook over their arm in order to do uh, grappling actions. Additionally, if you're using shields, and bear in mind that shields were definitely used in China at this time quite extensively, but if shields are of, uh, in the equation, then having this extension on the back, if you're trying to get around someone's shield, then you can hook the top of your, sorry, the bottom of your hilt over the top of their shield to open them up in order to get over the top of the shield and get in at them. Uh, so absolutely, there are lots of things you can do with this extension at the back of the sword. Now, you'll also notice that coming back to the heft and the balance, one of the things is that this sword really moves all around really, really nicely. Now, I have practiced Kung Fu uh, for a couple of years of my life, but I never did weapons, I only did ar unarmed stuff. So I am no authority on the use of Chinese swords, certainly not from the Ming Dynasty. <laughs> However, there are better channels for that, uh, like the Scholar General, for example, shout out there. But um, my impression is this is a sword which, despite it's, it's not a lightweight sword, it is, uh, it moves it feels lighter than it is. It moves incredibly well, but once it is moving, it feels like it has a lot of momentum to it. It feels like it's going to hit with authority. It does not particularly feel like a civilian dueling sword, 
it does feel like a battle sword. Now in terms of the stats on this particular sword, it weighs just over 1100 grams, I've just weighed it, and uh, the blade should be, as far as I recall, around 29 inches. Yes, yeah, 29 and a half inches, which is 74 and a half centimeters for those of you who want metric. Um, so it's not a particularly long sword, it's not a particularly short sword, it's uh, quite very very comparable actually to medieval arming swords of a similar period. And some of you might say, well Matt, fundamentally is this like a Chinese arming sword? It kind of is, yes, but the big difference is you have to remember that in China during the Ming Dynasty the standard sword of most soldiers was a Dao of various types. And these straight jian by this point were really only carried by very high ranking people and indeed by court officials as well. So it was really the, the noble sword of this period, whereas arming swords in Europe, of course, were carried by everyone, um, obviously of different qualities and, and uh, decoration and stuff like this. But there is a big difference in China compared to Europe at this time. We also have to remember, of course, that um, in the Ming Dynasty, there was quite a lot of, <laughs> quite famously, um, conflict between China and various other people around, including the Mongols or Tatars, as they were sometimes known in Europe, um, and who were using forms of Dao predominantly. They weren't using straight swords like this. And equally, if we look at Japan, for example, that were doing quite a lot of uh, sea-bound competitiveness, uh, uh, piracy, uh, essentially, um, at this time, this is a completely different sword to anything really being used in Japan. At that time, the J Japanese, by this point, were uh, using the Tachi uh, and then transitioning through the Uchi Katana into the, what we now know as the Katana. Uh, but this is a completely different sword to that. But you might say, oh, but Matt, they, they used to have a sword like that in Japan. That's very, very true. They did have types of Jien, and they are not hugely different to this. So if you see, sometimes there are temple swords in Japan, and they do look a bit like this Ming Dynasty Jien, but what they actually are is an earlier version. There is an earlier, you know, 9th, 10th century type of Jien, which indeed was uh, used in Japan. And that was the Chinese Jian of that period. This is a later descendant. This is the 14th to 16th century, 14th to 17th century descendant of that type of Jian. And it's not functionally hugely different. It is pretty much the same. And there were types of Jian being produced and used all the way through to the 20th, I was gonna say the 19th, but in fact the 20th century. Um, and indeed, for anyone who practices uh, Tai Chi, you will notice some similarity between what you perceive to be a Tai Chi sword, which is a form of Jian, and uh, this indeed. But I should reiterate that this is a different beast in the hand to some of those Jian. Some of those Jian which were really civilian dueling weapons and weapons of the nobility of scholars and such like. This is this feels more like a medieval arming sword with a long grip, basically. It is a substantial and big um, sword. 1100 grams, so it's not crazy heavy. Uh, my rapier, for example, is 1300 grams, um, but this is comparable to lot in, in mass alone to lots of medieval arming swords or indeed sort of Viking era swords as well. So it is, in my view, a battlefield weapon. But we still have to wonder <laughs> the tip. What is that about? Why did they have rounded tips some of the time? Why did they have pointed blades some of the time? Um, a very interesting thing. Now I'm very briefly going to do a little bit of cutting with this and then we'll assess how it stands up. 
So I just got back in from testing this sword and I have to say I really like this. Um, I'm obviously familiar with the Ming Dynasty Jian look um, and I'd seen these swords for many years. I've never owned one before and never a replica of one. And um, I, I have to say that I didn't think they were the most appealing swords in the world to me. But actually owning one, it's quite different in the hand to how you expect it to be. It's, it's quite a beefy business-like weapon. It feels, it feels very serious. It feels very like an arming sword, actually, even if it doesn't particularly look like one. Um, and I think for a lot of uh, people, particularly coming from a sort of medieval point of view or a Western point of view, probably find these pommels and these guards somewhat odd looking. But once you get used to them, I found they kind of grow on me and I particularly like the details of the grip construction, the way that you've got these uh, sections, big uh, metal enclosed sections at top and bottom, holding everything in together. And uh, even the fitting of this uh, for the lanyard um, knot, sword knot, through the middle there, which I didn't attach a sword knot to actually, because one didn't come with it, so I just, uh, I just left it off. Um, but, uh, and you've got a secondary one up here. Now I don't, incidentally, I don't know why there are two particular holes there. Perhaps someone can chime in if you know why there are why there are two holes rather than one. I don't know. I would imagine in terms of the construction that this is a hollow pin that goes through the tang section incidentally but the uh, the hilt construction method is is not uh, evident from the outside. But in terms of how this performed uh, really well this sword cuts uh, really really nicely. Um, so it's got a single bevel edge as mentioned which means it glides through the through the bottles it's not super sharp you could certainly make this sharper it's what lk chen calls sword sharp now i'm not squeezing tightly and rubbing my hand long but i can as you see i can run my fingers along the edge and not get cut but it feels fine so what this is is a very thin edge if not a particularly bitey edge but it glides through water bottles and you know what it cut wood pretty well as well now that hitting the wood is not really to test what the weapon does to the wood, it's to test what the wood does to the weapon. And it's to test um, a couple of things. First of all, the blade strength, uh, including the tang, of course, but also the hilt construction. And I can tell you that nothing has come uh, loose or, you know, there's no movement in the guard. There's nothing creaking, rattling, anything like that. So it's all still solid and tight as when I began. There is absolutely no... Uh, damage to the edge that I can see, although I do see some very fine little scratches where uh, probably where I was hitting the wood. Um, so I can see where I was hitting it, uh, but that would polish out. Now, I should also mention that these blades come in three different options uh, LK Chen offer, and I'm not certain which one I've got. So if you want to buy one of these, feel free to message them and ask which one I got uh, if you want the same one. Uh, but um, they do some different uh, San Mai and also essentially pattern welded uh, steel options, different um, types of steel. Now I can see there's a very faint um, pattern in this steel. Uh, which suggests it's not a simple mono steel to me, um, sort of a crystalline type um, uh, structure in the surface in the in the polish. Uh, but it's it's beautiful. It's all just as straight as it started off. Looking up the bevels, there is minimal rippling. It's very very smooth, uh, very flat. The mid rib is dead straight, arrow straight, very nicely done. So overall, I'm a big fan of this sword. Um, as a user, the only very slight thing when swinging it around and hitting things that I found was that my hand does have a tendency to slide down this grip. It's one of the issues with having grips that are longer than they, uh, than they need to be to fit your hand in. Um, so that is one thing to just mention. The only thing I would say though is having that extra long grip gives you a lot of versatility for how you gripped the sword. You could absolutely slide down to the pommel end uh, like with a Viking era sword and, and hold it at the bottom and swing if you want wanted some extra reach. Equally, if you really wanted to, for whatever reason, you could put your thumb up the back, uh, maybe to get the point online more easily or to do a snap cut. Um, but it cuts great. It seems to be super strong, super durable. Um, it didn't come into any issues whatsoever in the blade or the hilt encountering bottles or wood. Um, and so I can Highly recommend, based on my testing so far, I can highly recommend uh, the Grand Martial Sword from LK Chen. And hopefully, 
If you weren't familiar with these already, this might open up another avenue of reading and research for you. Ming Dynasty Chinese swords, fascinating things used against numerous different opponents in this period and contemporaries of the medieval arming sword and long sword. I hope this has been interesting for you. Thanks a lot for watching. Check out the links below to LK Chen's website and see all of the other fantastic swords they've got on offer. And um, I will see you back on the channel really soon. Cheers, folks.